I guess no matter else, whatever else happens today is worth the price of admission. Uh, <laughs> they all worked on that last song together, each camp. <clears throat> um, this is very encouraging. Uh, as has been mentioned, as you know, the pastor's going to be out for the next two weeks, so we've rearranged things, and I'll be shifting the study of Galatians to this hour, so you may turn to the book of uh, well, actually, we're going to start in Colossians. So you can be going to Colossians chapter 2 to start. I'm just going to go ahead and read. Uh, a few verses before we go to prayer. Starting in verse 6. So reading in verse 6 through verse 8, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Uh, we will be in this passage a little bit later on, but uh, I'm going to have to get this going here. But as before we get going, let's go ahead and look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful for your grace and provision for us. We thank you for the truth of that put to song this morning, both in hymns and in the special music. This draws ourselves to focus on you and commit our way to you. We pray that you would guide our time now and enable us to put aside any distractions, be able to focus on what's heard. Father, we know your word challenges our hearts. We need to be open to that challenge. We pray that we would uh, follow you in this and allow you to work in our hearts this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, I'm not sure what's. Oh, here we go. All set. Um, as I said, we'll we'll be in uh, Galatians. Oh, there it is. And I'm going to simply continue with where I've left off in the first hour. And we happen to have just finished chapter five, which is a good point to have this little diversion here, second hour. And I, uh, at which point I intend to take more time with a detailed examination of true spirituality as a topic. Uh, among other matters in the book of Galatians, spirituality has received particular attention from Paul. Now we've come to an appropriate point in the letter, uh, and as we have come to these points, I have stopped along the way to look closely at several subjects, and we looked at several already, including the gospel, justification, grace, law, legalism, liberty, and now spirituality. And for those of you who are bearing with the study, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You see we're almost down to the bottom of the list. But uh, at any rate, uh, we will take a few weeks to look at the doctrine of spirituality. Uh, this is not a subject that we are necessarily unfamiliar with. In fact, this is a matter that most of us probably feel that we have a fairly strong biblical frame of reference relating to. But I have noticed in myself that the study of Galatians has honed my understanding of this truth, which has been further developed, I believe, uh, as I have prepared to teach this, and that uh, preparing process has gone on in parallel as I've been working through the text. I've kept notes and, and done some reading. Because this speaks to the essence of our lives as believers, its importance cannot be overemphasized. It needs not only to be accurate, but clear and relevant. Over the course of my preparations, um, I've been very excited uh, about what I've come across and what has struck me in a fresh way about a subject that I have at least wanted to think that I had a solid handle on. 
The essence of true spirituality may be expressed rather simply, but its practical details and implications are extensive. Uh, the challenge before me is to take all of these various facets of this subject and choreograph them in a way that flows and conveys to you a solid framework of both a philosophical and technical theology or theological uh, framework of biblical spirituality that you will find useful by way of application. Now this is a lofty goal, but it is too serious a matter to simply give it a passing stab or shrink back from what may amount to a tough journey, both on my part and yours. Now, this is going to require concentration, thought, and above all, a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit in leading us into all truth. Because this is still a work in progress in my preparation, uh, week by week, and I don't have the luxury of taking a sabbatical and assembling this as a complete package, you're going to find me circling back either to fill in gaps that I find that I've left or for further development that I see might be necessary on a particular topic. And please, please um, pray with me that this turns out to be beneficial. That's the objective, ultimately. Now, up front, I want to acknowledge a couple of primary references that I've consulted. I've read a number of things, but here's, here's the two primary ones. Uh, the first is the work by Francis A. Schaeffer. You might be familiar with, with him. You may have done some reading uh, by Francis Schaeffer, the book True Spirituality. And this book tackles the theology of spirituality more from the philosophical standpoint. As you see, it is um, in the subtitle, if you can read that, I believe you can, How to Live for Jesus Moment by Moment. Schaefer offers in this that essentially as the essence of true spirituality, we're talking about walking with the Lord moment by moment. So I'll let you in on that one right out of the gate anyway. The second book that tackles, uh, it tackles the theology of spirituality more from the technical standpoint. You might recognize this as the classic work by Lewis Berry Chafer, He That Is Spiritual. I would imagine that several have read that, if not once, more than once. Now, my present intent is to work more from the philosophical to the technical uh, point of view as we go through the subject. Now, Francis Schaeffer and Lewis Berry Chafer are on the same page as far as spirituality, spirituality is concerned. It's just that their presentation is, is different. And it's helpful to see it from both angles, as it were. Now, this, this examination that we embark on is not going to simply be a regurgitation of these two books. So I would highly recommend, uh, if you're interested further in this, that you, that you would pursue an individual reading of these works. And again, there are other references that I consulted that I'll be citing along the way. Now, as we've seen in our study of Galatians, just as there is only one way of salvation, there is only one way of spirituality. Now, this is by God's plan. We're still in Colossians. Look again at verse 6 of chapter 2. As you, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. I would imagine that virtually all of us here would agree about the narrow way of salvation. Faith alone in Christ alone. But if we have a problem as believers seeking to live the Christian life, apart from the problem of simply not desiring to do God's will, if we have a problem, it's a mistaken view and approach to spirituality. So this is, I think, why we need to take some time to look at this. Now, I'd like to start out as we proceed with a positive statement at this point in a summary form of what spirituality is. We're going to be developing this in much more detail so that you can see further as we go the basis for this. But because I'm going to quickly move into a discussion of what spirituality is not, I thought we should at least start out on a positive note. 
turn back to Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. Chapter 13, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Note the close parallel with Galatians 5.16, a verse that we've spent considerable time in already, which says, Walk in the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Though the phrase, Walk in the Spirit, is clearly an expression of spirituality. Note by way of this parallel that we find in Romans 13, 14. We see the same, the essence of the same um, directive. Put on or clothe yourself with Christ. By walking in, walking by the Spirit, we in effect put on, we clothe ourselves with Christ. In essence then, Spirituality is being clothed with Christ. Turn now to uh, Philippians 3, verse 7. We're going to read uh, down through verse 11 here. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul covers a lot of ground here, but I think in what we've read you can see the connection to what we've already seen in Romans 13, 14. Spirituality involves death to self and living in light of our position in Christ. In keeping with this, among other ways he expresses it, Francis Schaeffer simply calls true spirituality the Christian life. True spirituality is the Christian life. From God's perspective, there is no other Christian life. Thus, spirituality is not distinct from it. Now, these passages may not coincide with those that we have traditionally associated with an explicit statement of spirituality, passage among several others that we will be looking at. But these draw us to the fuller context of this truth. There are many facets of spirituality that we will examine that will take on greater relevance and clarity as we place them in this context. All right, now let's move on to what spirituality is not. I'd like to discuss that out, this at the outset just so we have a sense of maybe maybe we'll, we'll be confronted by some of these things up front so we'd be more prepared for moving into what it is. True spirituality is of the heavenly realm. As such, it is entirely consistent with God's nature. We have just seen this in our consideration uh, of the fruit of the Spirit for those who have been in the first hour. True spirituality is mutually exclusive with human viewpoint and human energy in any way. Turn, we're going to do some background before we go into some specifics here. Turn to Isaiah 55, verse 6. Isaiah 55, 6. Starting in 6, and we'll be reading down through verse 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. No doubt that's a memory verse to several, and if it hasn't been committed to memory, that would be one of the ones to put on your list. God's thoughts and ways infinitely transcend man's ways. God's thoughts and ways are above. Man's ways are in keeping with the elemental principles of the world. At the outset, we read in Colossians 2.8, without going back there, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Now that's in the context of putting on Christ. So there is an alternative to putting on Christ. But we first notice this phrase here, the phrase elemental principles of the world, in our look at Galatians 4. And let's turn there, Galatians chapter 4, to see it in this context. Galatians 4, 3. We'll just read verse 3, then we're going to jump down to verse 8 and read 8 and 9. Even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. I'm just trying to show you that there is a, something called the elements of the world. Now, 8 and 9. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God's. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? The weak and beggarly elements. The elements of the world. By way of context, Paul is here focused in Galatians on legalism as being of that category. But this phrase is broader in, it, in, the, in its fullest sense. And it relates to the human viewpoint of life and the breadth of ways in which that can be expressed by way of, in, in man's mind, spirituality. There are a number of other ways in which that manifests itself besides legalism. And the following approaches we'll be looking at, the following approaches to spirituality, co constitute man's ways in keeping with the elemental principles of the world. They are all attempted and or achieved in and through the flesh. They do not and cannot breach the barrier between God and man in terms of that spiritual contact walking with the Lord these represent and rely on the capacities of man and are confined to the natural realm now here's the full list of what we're going to be looking at there are likely additional categories that could be included but in thinking this over for a while, considering the relevance to our perhaps present culture, this is what I ended up with. Let me go down them. What spirituality is not? Moralism, legalism, sentimentalism, emotionalism, stoicism, piety or religiosity, which are essentially the same, intellectualism, asceticism, Gnosticism, Mysticism and antinomianism. Some big words there. Don't let it scare you off. We'll go through these one by one and describe these as we go. Now, before we go through these, my intent is not to identify them with any particular groups of individuals. It will be obvious as you we look at these that there are certain religions, religious organizations, civic or fraternal groups, and even Christians of various groupings that have institutionalized these at some level in being the way to spirituality. Also, people in general have adopted them in various forms because they are in keeping with the frame of reference of the natural mind. One might say, I'm, not, I'm an atheist, but he lives by some form of these or some combination of these nonetheless. And some of these, though they're categorized, do overlap a little bit. Uh, maybe they function closely together, but they can be described distinctly. 
The purpose is to relate to these not as they apply to organizations that come to mind, but to relate to these by way of personal application. Through our old sin nature, we still have an affinity for these. And apart from clothing ourselves with Christ, we will walk in them in some combination. We are the ones who need a particular or personal challenge. All right, let's start with moralism. This could, uh, could be described also as morality, simple, just straight morality. Now, this is not a knock on the general benefits of good morals or a complete dissociation of morality from spirituality. Rather, it is differentiating morality from spirituality when it represents what we call human good or human goodness. Natural man is not without the ability to distinguish good from evil. And by his conscience, he is compelled to assess his behavior according to an innate sense of reality of this good and evil. Now, we see this dynamic in Romans chapter 2. So let's turn to Romans again, but this time back to chapter 2. Romans 2.14 Romans 2, 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. You might be familiar with the, the angel devil on the shoulder cartoon figures where there's that battle going on. And, uh, now, Paul is speaking of unbelievers here. He's speaking of Gentiles that are compelled to react or respond to their conscience. And they order their life after some uh, code, at least personal code, that they develop and live by. And though the degree of good at which this is manifest in individuals varies, every man lives by a standard of right and wrong. And this then yields the relative scale of goodness by which man tends to measure himself and reckon himself good and even reckon himself deserving of God's favor. But turn to Isaiah 64 and what do we find here with respect to human righteousness? I know many of you are already quoting it in your minds. It is a memory verse that uh, probably is popular as well. Isaiah 64, 6. We will be reading verses 6 and 7. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Now this could be applying to believing Jews or unbelieving Jews. But the fact is, he's speaking of our righteousnesses. Those are our own human good attempts at achieving righteousness. And yet, we see in the context that it doesn't attain the standard accepted by God. In fact, it's very stark there that it, in, in its being condemned. Now, in the believer, morality and spirituality may be indistinguishable in certain ways because we can only see what is produced by way of outward appearance. Yet, it's what is happening in the heart that counts. The believer can operate in the realm of human good in terms of morality and miss the mark of spirituality. We can produce an outward manifestation of good that is devoid of the spirit. And we can base our sense of spiritual well-being on our own moral performance. As high as the heavens are above the earth, 
this way misses God's way. Morality, as described here, is not spirituality. Next, legalism. We've already spent considerable time with this topic in the course of the Galatian study. Legalism takes morality to a specific level whereby goodness or righteousness is achieved by adherence to a precise code. Man's sense of spiritual well-being is derived not only by his moral performance, but by the system to which he yokes his performance. Legalistic schemes are abundant, so in order for a legalist to feel spiritual, he would, not, he would have to not only have confidence in his adhering to his system, but also somehow be assured that he is adhering to the right system. Well, there is no right system in this vein. And the basis of righteousness is no different than for morality in general. Turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Romans 10.1, reading the first four verses. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, Paul is speaking specifically here of a Judaistic system of legalism. But in verse 4, we see Christ is the end of the law. That's the principle of law. It's a broader uh, realm of legalistic modes of function toward righteousness. We've seen how Scripture rejects general human good as a manifestation of spirituality. We saw that in Isaiah 64. And here we find in Romans further that particular conforming of our goodness to law, mosaic or otherwise, falls short of righteousness and thus falls short of true spirituality. Sentimentalism. Now this may be described for our purposes here as the indulgence of feelings or human sensibilities. The indulgence of our feelings or human sensibilities. Now, this in itself isn't necessarily a problem in temporal matters. We're sentimental about certain things, right? Relationships, um, objects that might have value, family heirlooms, etc. But when it is allowed to intrude into spiritual matters, it will undermine spirituality. Now, this isn't so much of an organized approach to spirituality as it is an impulse that overtakes us. It is seen in deriving a sense of spirituality subjectively from our feelings about something rather than objectively through proper orientation to the truth of the Word of God. An example of this that would be familiar to most of us would be some of the Christian chain emails that get spread around. I hear some chuckles. Uh, most of them offer a narrative or storyline couched in Christianese. Of these, uh, of the ones that I've read, most of the accounts, even though not represented as such, are fictionalized. They are designed to tug at your emotional heartstrings. And if you're not careful, you will take a detour into sentimentality or even a touch of mysticism. Now, as you noted, uh, we're going to be looking at mysticism, so we'll, we'll leave that for later. But our tendency towards spiritual sentimentality isn't limited to emails, of course. It has found its way into many pulpits. It may even form the underlying basis for a believer's Christian life if they're not grounded in the Word of God. It may seem innocuous enough, but it no more hits the mark of true spirituality than those things that more obviously don't. Bluntly, 
spiritual sentimentalism is a mixing of the Word of God with feeling rather than a mixing of the Word of God with faith. It is essentially uh, void of the power of the truth it relates or it relates to because we are ultimately depending on something within ourselves for our spirituality. It's mush. It's fluff. We must see it as exclusive of true spirituality and that it amounts to building one's life on sand. It will not sustain one through the storms of life. Turn to Ephesians 4. Verse 13. We'll be reading just through 15. That's what it would be in Ephesians here. I'm just breaking into this. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ. This is what we're after. Sentimentalism doesn't achieve this. And it actually is probably well explained or expressed here by being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine because it's not based on an objective Embracing of the truth of the Word of God. Emotionalism. Now that's akin to sentimentalism. But whereas sentimentalism is more inward, emotionalism is more outward. It could be described as excessive appeal to emotions as the conduit or expression of godliness. Excessive appeal to emotions as the conduit or expression of godliness. At the outset, I must say that emotions themselves are not the problem. Emotions are a vital part of the created nature of man. They represent a facet of the image of God in man. But emotions were designed by God to be the responder of the soul, not the initiator. In their normal function, emotions simply reflect what is going on in the soul. So there is nothing inherently wrong with emotions the whole spectrum of emotions, but they must be functioning in their proper order by design. As Christians, we sometimes ascribe more to emotions than is warranted. We see emotion as a vehicle to spirituality or evidence of spirituality. Some associate worship or certain aspects of worship, private or corporate, with a working up of emotion to various degrees, sometimes to a frenzy. We can actually derive a high off of our emotions, which itself is mistaken and misrepresented as spirituality. Part of the problem is ignorance of the proper God-created nature and function of emotion. But a bigger part of the problem is the mistaken belief that certain emotions reflect one's spirituality. This prompts one to exhibit these emotions in achieving or validating their spirituality. I've had people comment on how crying in response to music or message was an indication of spirituality. Now, spirituality and crying are not incompatible. I don't want you to think that. But one's spirituality cannot simply be reduced to a connection between the two. Or likewise, the other end of the spectrum, ecstatics. Cannot simply connect spirituality with an outward manifestation of emotion. As with sentimentalism, emotionalism is subjective and devoid of stability and power in faith-based connection to the Word of God. And finally, there's the problem of compartmentalization that comes with emotion-based spirituality. One's Christian experience is divided between those emotion-charged spiritual moments and the rest of just grinding it out in your life when facing it day to day. 
There is no such predicament or partition confronting true spirituality. Spirituality transcends circumstances and emotions. Stoicism. Some, recognizing the problem of emotionalism, have reacted and gone in the opposite direction. This could be called anti-emotionalism. Some have determined that spirituality involves the repression of emotion. In other words, one derives spirituality by suppressing emotion in the face of circumstances that would otherwise evoke emotion of one form or another. According to freedictionary.com, the root word stoic is derived from a Greek school of philosophy of about 300 B.C., whose views in later Roman form advocated the calm acceptance of all occurrences as the unavoidable result of divine will or of the natural order. So you can see even then there was a connection to spirituality in the Greek realm of philosophy and in the Roman world. Now this relates to the official word origin. And maybe that's what people might say this found its origin at. But, in fact, this tendency of the flesh was not created by Greek scholars. They simply are describing it in this way or codifying it. This is simply a facet of man's pride in seeking to establish in his own strength a successful, if not spiritual, way of life. The technical answer to Stoicism is essentially the same as to emotionalism. Neither the presence nor the absence of emotion determines one's spirituality. People have different personalities. Obviously, we recognize that. The same circumstance is going to affect the exact same situation for the same person that that should affect them exactly the same way is going to evoke a different reaction, outwardly, at least. The practical answer to Stoicism is humility. Stoicism's suppression of emotion thwarts the natural function of emotions in the ways that are beneficial to the individual. Not only is spirituality not gained by doing this, but harm to the person many times results. With Stoicism, there may be the appearance of stability, but it amounts to a grinding it out approach that is fraught with uncertainty and many times leaves one in inner turmoil irrespective of their outward appearance of calm. Stoicism. Piety or religiosity. These terms are essentially synonymous and I think they readily conjure an image in our mind. Piety may be defined as an outward posture of reverence accompanied by devout fulfillment of religious obligations. It is an attempt by outward appearance to attain or to at least project spirituality. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. And we're going to start in verse 23. And go down to verse 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. A couple of things here. Yes, I've cited a passage speaking of the piety of unbelieving Pharisees. So how is that relevant? 
As we've seen, Scripture is clear on the ongoing presence of the old sin nature in the life of the believer. What is true of the Pharisees in their unbelief may be true of the believer in his unbelief relative to this truth of spirituality. Though secure in his position in Christ, as we've seen, the believer may opt to live his Christian life in the flesh. Though this in certain forms like morality, legalism, and piety may mimic conformity to godliness, such a believer is out of fellowship with the Lord. There is only one way to true spirituality. There is no partial spirituality or partial credit for looking right or playing the part. That's why it's so important to get it right. Now let's back up and we're going to have to end in this passage and pick up next week with the rest of this list and other stuff. By Matthew 15, verse 7. I'm sorry, Matthew 15, 7. through verse 9. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So in, in wrapping this up, these are categories of spirituality that are akin or are of the natural realm, the elemental principles of the world, but they may be embraced at various levels and in various combinations by the believer in the absence of an understanding of true spirituality or simply in, in a posture of a lack of desire to walking with the Lord and, and wanting to still have some satisfaction that he's okay enough. So we will uh, let's close in prayer and then um, Steve will come up for a, a hymn as we close. Father, we thank you for the simplicity that we find in Christ, the simplicity of the truth. We find that the, the difficulty comes in abiding and, and putting on Christ moment by moment. But it's not because your truth is confusing. There are some areas that might be difficult, but we thank you for the ministry of the Spirit that guides and directs us into all truth. And we know that you will make these things real to those who are seeking to understand uh, your word and truth and apply it accordingly. Father, we just uh, pray that these things would encourage us or challenge us as you see the need in each of our hearts that we might be drawn into that closer, more confident, more Christ-glorifying walk with you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.